Well, good evening, everybody. It's six o'clock and we have a quorum. So let's call the meeting to order. Uh, this happens to be our 80th meeting. How about that? Wow. I'm trying to only call them out every five or so. You know, but, you know, you know, we'll wait till we get to the hundred. Um, yeah, so welcome everyone. Um, under old business, uh, we have minutes from January 31st. And I noted that uh, uh, Nancy did send them out again later today. There was one little uh, typo under on page two under the owner's report. The word the is corrected to say the. Well moved. Yeah, you know, Lois spotted that, right? <laughs> I could stop. I was going to break. Would you like me to stop? No. Please. <laughs> I aspire. Okay. I had to All stop. right. So uh, that was Bob. That was Bob Ike uh, moving for approval. We have a second. Second. Second from. Um, Bob Berman, thank you. Any other discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 I believe that was any nays, abstentions? It was unanimous. Okay, thank you. All right, so um, on to new business, and we can go right to um, balance. All right, Hi. Anthony live. Good evening, everybody. I think this is it for, for down the Downs crew today. Johnny's on vacation. Scott wasn't feeling well, uh, so he's not going to be in attendance. Let me share my screen here and go over uh, the agenda that I got. All right, first things first, item 1A, subcontractor and permit update. Um, we have obviously issued all the all the subcontracts, so we're not going to be talking about that anymore. We are waiting on copies of our mechanical plumbing and fire protection uh, permits from our subcontractors. Uh, we did receive our electrical permit. Uh, they do have a copy <laughs> of our general building permit to reference numbers. Um, we did talk to Dwight. Uh, it should be pretty much imminent at this point. Uh, to getting those permits in hands from our mechanical plumbing, uh, who are actually MJ Daly's do, doing both, and then Wolverine, who is our fire protection uh, sprinkler subcontractor. So we like to get those in. Obviously, we're going to be starting underground uh, utilities once the concrete work starts. Uh, so it's it's imperative that we get these permits in our hand uh, at this point in time. Item 1B, schedule update construction-wise. Just want to give a little update on our MEP coordination process. Uh, we have worked out the children's area. Uh, we've modeled it with the design team's input and all the corrective actions uh, that they have given us. We, KLS, our consultant, MEP-wise, has provided the drawings for level one and two uh, to be reviewed by our MEP subcontractors for any minor clashes and uh, basically routing. So what I've learned is there's very different levels of BIM coordination. Level 200 is what we own with KLS, which shows us pathways, major pathways of ductwork, piping, conduits, so on and so forth. Once we complete that, we give them a signed off coordinated drawing on level 200, and they in turn create that into a level 400 which gives them locations of their hangers, the finer details, let's call it, but that is on our MEP subcontractors at that point in time. So we've done our due diligence uh, to get them the, the standard routing uh, and procedures and methods that, that are gonna take place. Uh, another major item that we could basically take off the list is our structural wood framing shop drawings. MHA, the structural engineer, has given an approved as noted. Uh, they're in Jeff's court right now with TSKP. Um, I think those should be back in our core at some point tomorrow. Uh, what makes those important is the coordination efforts between the installations of the structural wood and the structural steel since they interconnect with one another. Uh, we have uh, provided a coordinated model between the two subcontractors, so hopefully everything is going to fit nice and snug and, and be ready to go. Um, we did sit, submit a updated schedule as of J uh, January 31st, uh, 2024. We originally, um, a month prior, were forecasting out on our schedule to be completed sometime in the month of April with our coordination efforts uh, with our subcontractors and optimization for some durations. We were able to bring that back into March 7th. Uh, we are further reviewing the schedule with our subcontractors to even tighten that up 
uh, even more at this point in time. Um, right now, we do have um, some negotiations to do with Berlin Steel. Uh, so if we could get this concrete done, we'd like to get them uh, the structural steel out there for April 8th. So we're in talks with Berlin Steel to try to make that happen. Uh, it wouldn't be a bad idea to getting the steel on site, sitting and waiting if possible. Because uh, I know structural steel is usually one of those items that, you know, you're waiting for, believe it or not, on a job. Uh, but this time, I think we'll be able to uh, to get it on site, waiting for us to, to finish up the concrete. Jason's got many tricks up his sleeve to continue the, the progress and to tighten up the schedule. Uh, so we're working with the team accordingly. Um, moving down the list here, a couple items, just a hot bullet for Prosser. The tree root protection mat will be be placed will to be placed uh, next as we start you know moving some machinery out to that front side of the building. Manafort and their subcontractor subsurface has completed all the installations of the aggregate piers uh, as of two nine. The debris load load out of Riley Building has also been completed. That's with Stanford Wrecking uh, site soils uh, that are we're kind of digging out are being stockpiled by Manafort. Um, based on the soil management plan, uh, there is some hazardous chemicals within the soils. Uh, we have placed uh, poly on the ground with Jersey barriers and created uh, some lay down areas for this polluted soil. Uh, we do have GeoQuest uh, and Wealthy that are going to come out and check to see if this material may be suitable uh, to be reused on site. Uh, so with that being said, there's some more investigative and characteristic properties that we need to investigate uh, for those soil site soil stockpiles. Um, Manafort has completed all the tracking pads for the field office and uh, entrance gates. Uh, this way we can keep the roads uh, nice and tidy as much as we can and not track dirt into the public roadway. Um, the old underground unforeseen concrete foundations have been removed and disposed of. Uh, we'll be able to use this this weight. They came out as clean. We'll be able to use this weight uh, towards our lead credit of recycled content. It was all concrete. Uh, usually concrete is all recyclable as long as it doesn't have ACM or some type of hazardous sticky material on it. Uh, site grading for the new Prosser Library has started along with foundation excavations in prep for our cast and place concrete work. Uh, those are currently going on. We are going to protect them over the weekend, uh, cover them and heat them uh, because we do not want to in, encounter any frost of any nature. Um, so those heaters are going to be running all weekend to keep that ground nice and warm for once concrete starts on Monday, as you can see here, which is the next bullet statement for 219.24. And then after that, we'll soon follow. Once concrete goes in, we'll start the underground MEP utility installations. Uh, through the MEP coordination process, we have pinpointed and located the sleeves where these utilities are going to be coming into the building through the foundation, concrete foundation walls. All right. Right now, there's really not much to uh, elaborate on for the Riley lot other than it's being used for a uh, stored material laydown area for our subcontractors, as well as a big, huge stockpile of this polluted soil that has come out. <laughs> Item 1C here, requisitions and change order proposals. We're currently working on February 2024. Uh, I am currently assembling it with our subcontractors, so there will be no formal requisition uh, approval for this time. There are a couple COPs that I just want to bring to everybody's attention and one official COP here at the bottom. Uh, COP number 6 is some electrical room layout revisions for PR3. We will be submitting it to the design team and Colliers for their review, and that was a cost of $24,896. And I just want to put a caveat is when we have these meetings, some of these figures will change um, from meeting to meeting based on hard physical pricing that we have proposals that we have in hand will adjust the number accordingly. All right, so COP number seven, the children's room MEP modifications, which was PR number four. We've worked that out, hopefully, with uh, with our MEP subcontractors. That's a budget number of $35,000. COP number nine, structural revisions and clarifications, PR number 005. That's a $4,900 budget. I expect that, actually, at this point in time, to come in under that $4,900. Well, excuse me, when you say budget, what 
That's just numbers that we haven't physically received proposals from our subcontractors. So basically, it's not in the budget. Right? No, 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 no. That's just strictly, you know, based on what we've seen on past projects or, you know, rough order magnitude that we got from our subcontractors. It's, it's basically a, it's a guess. Really. Thank you. What usually happens is they send them to us and our mechanical team. So we'll go through and just make sure that you know, that number is chiseled down and down and down. And, down. <laughs> and what's nice too, and, and I don't know if any other subcontractors have this, but electricians usually what's called NECA, right? What they do is with this NECA program and the software program, it's fit, they, they put in the quantities of the scope of what changed. It automatically populates the labor hours based on production rates. It applies the, the latest um, rate for price mm -hmm. and it kind of spits out a spits out a nice number uh, for the electrician. So it's a, it's a great program to have that they use. Um, I wish some other subcontractors would, you know, we could create a program same thing like Nika does for, for our electricians. But anyways, that's neither here nor there. All right, COP number 10, exterior routing of tell data. That's PR number 006. That's a $23,000 budget until we get hard pricing proposals in from our subcontractors. COP number 11, which is the door hardware clarification revisions. That is a, a hard cost of $13,547. Again, I have in parentheses here to be reviewed by the design team colliers and um, our team as well. COP number 12 is some wetland clarifications. Uh, we have a $25,700 budget in there. A lot of the work is for Manafort. Uh, there is quite a bit of added items that they're sifting through with their vendors and their manufacturers to get us a price on. Uh, I believe I should have that um, in our hands by the end of this week. COP number 13 was the unforeseen underground existing foundations that we came across. <laughs> I am showing a, a zero dollar ad here as we have um, set aside a budget of $15,000 for Manafort, which we're tracking via TNM. Uh, that has been substantiated by uh, Jason. Um, and the deduct of $15,000 is from our impediment allowance, which was established in our GMP. Okay. All that work again uh, to keep moving in the field per schedule was tracked on TNM, which Jason verifies all the, the time and the material and equipment used uh, to date to remove that concrete. Um, COP 14, I just got a notification today that I can make this COP go away. It will be a zero cost. Um, I negotiated it out with Stanford Wrecking uh, for them to have no cost for, for the COP. So that will be voided and uh, go back to zero and take it off, off the COP lot at this point in time. What I do like to talk about tonight uh, officially is a COP uh, for DESCO's contract agreement. There was a scope issue uh, during the scope of work and the contract negotiations with DESCO, who was our millwork provider, um, about some plywood ceilings. Uh, there was verbiage that they were confused on uh, via the spec. Um, it didn't correlate well with the way our scope of work was written. Uh, we are looking for an ad of $40,000 and applied to this. Actually, we've brought Desco down, I think it was from 150 something thousand dollars down. It was higher than that. Was, was it higher yeah. than that? I should have pulled it up in, in front yeah. of me, but um, it was higher than that. We negotiated with them to come down to $80,000. Uh, we've talked to Mark and Nancy about this this scope issue in this contract agreement uh we were going to split a out of our cm construction contingency forty thousand dollars that would remain forty thousand dollars as you see here added cost to the owner's contingency at this point in time to uh to facilitate this contract agreement negotiation with desco who was our, our no work subcontract so I, yeah, I'd like to hit this right away yeah because uh, Nancy did distribute it to everybody yep. um Scott Scholl yep from your office I know he's been working on this for a very long time oh, extremely sharing long time. this as well as multiple getting, meetings with TSKP yeah. Yasu, and Jeff. yeah essentially it was a buyout of you know correct stuff you know so you know stuff we had a we had a contract for yeah so I commend you guys for you know putting the price down well oh, thank to you to the eight uh, yeah. And certainly the contingency helps as well. Absolutely. Um, do we have any questions on this, Clark? Yeah, so, sorry, I was just trying to get up to speed on this. Item. <laughs> Let's go. So you said it was a buyout item, but it, but it sounds like it's a missing scope. It's, 
It, it was a, it, they, they missed it correct uh, from our scope of work. Um, there was a level of confusion based on verbiage of what a plywood ceiling, what they figured would be. Uh, so they totally missed it. They didn't include uh, the amount of uh, material or labor in their contract or, or their scope of work. Did they exclude originally. it? Um, they did. It, well, they did exclude it uh, because they didn't have it in the first place. No, oh, did they exclude it in their... Oh, like verbiage in their proposal? No, yeah. I don't believe so. So... Mr. Yes. Architect, it was it clear in the documents as to what that scope was supposed to be covered? Well, it was clear on on the documents, yeah, but the spec had a reference to the community room and that custom wood ceiling. So they ran with just the spec, assuming that they didn't have to do what the drawings showed for the ceiling drawings, yeah. So, and I don't care for the general accusers contract, doesn't matter where it is in the contract documents, they don't. Exactly. So, but the issue then, and Anthony was the second bidder it. who was the second. So we were having issues. You guys were having issues with the bidding climate, and Correct. that person was about to back out, or they did. They were back. They were back. Yeah. Right. So then it became a whole issue with getting this thing built and dealing with this issue with them. So I said, you know, have them cut it, take it out of the contingency, and let's you know let's yep. rock and roll. So and we did our due diligence too. We went to the second in line uh, during the bid, who was uh, I think Zavarella. And they they were in the same predicament as Desco was, and they were also a hundred and something thousand dollars higher than, than Desco yeah. was at this point in time. So we were kind of stuck. We were stuck. stuck. Yeah, I, I, mean, I you know I, I think they did <laughs> due diligence to find out that it it was in fact a missed item as opposed to. I, I know where you're going with the clerk, and, and I've been there in the past where, you know, you say to the bidder, "You own it. I don't care whether you said you missed it or not. You right. own it. Period." But you know, I think based on the numbers received and the other bidders, uh, the determination that we hadn't paid for it yet mm -hmm. is legitimate. Um, and I think this pricing is really excellent. Originally, I think it was a hundred and high hundred hundred fifty eight thousand dollars. Yeah, one five seven. Yeah, and then we kind of we we broke them down. We got them down to eighty, and then we were able to to negotiate that. Split it. So let's just say, you know, it was, it was a big one. At least that much. We get that right in front. Have that. You're, you're keeping track. We're keeping track. All right. I'm not going to belabor. You know, you can always call the guy's bond. I mean, but oh, we, we talked about that. that. Talked about that. Then yeah. it's like then it's yeah. And and Desco, yeah, I believe you. Ran that road before. Desco is a very very good millworks of contractor. <laughs> one of the best fabricators in the state. Um, so we we have full confidence that they'll they'll do a, a bang up quality job for us. Yeah, I don't want to belabor a point. I just think no, but no, Clark, absolutely, your it's points are spot on. Spot on. I appreciate that. Um, uh, and and so bringing you up to speed here, um, that was discussed. Um, and just for everybody's edification, you know, theoretically, the bond company, you know, gives us some money and lets the bidder withdraw, so we can go to the next. But the next bidder didn't have it either, uh, and it would have held. Uh, so that was explored. But Sounds like you made the best of Clark, the situation. Keep digging like that. Thank you. And we did during the bid time too, I believe. I think it was only two bidders that we were yeah, right. with Zavarella wow. and Desco. Mm -hmm. We lost the Gier, who's one of the bigger, yep. you know, um Noah fabricators in the state. <laughs> right. Contract. They're very good. Um but they did a they did a bit for us. So. Uh more questions on this change order proposal. Any hands up, Nancy? I can't see everybody there. I won't see any. Okay. Uh, can we have a motion to accept change or proposal number four? So moved. Moved by Bob Berman, seconded by. Second. Jesse. Jesse. Hi, Jesse. Hi. Um, okay. Any other discussion? <laughs> Just one question, Mr. Chair. Yeah. So on the actual um, item descriptions, what? So what? These are crossed off. Mm -hmm. And then this box is circled. So what it is? That's a material cost for the year for the work. Okay. So that totals included. Correct. Yep. You're referring to the backup materials. Yeah. 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 Any other discussion? All in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any nays? Anybody abstaining? Motion passes.
All right. Thank, thank you, everybody. And then, uh, before you a uh, question, before yeah. you before you go on, this is Richard. I have a question uh, to to Downs about um, this program that you talked about that the electrician uses. This yep. pertains this pertains to I guess COP number six. And well, um, it, it, honestly, Richard, it will it will pertain to every change order here on out for you know that any proposals that we get from our electrician. Do you know the name of this program that he's using? I like think it's it's called NECA, N-E-C-A. National Electrical. National Electrical Contractors Association, whatever. I, I don't know the exact specific of it, but probably, yeah, it's, it's, it's owned probably by NECA. Guide to Change Order Proposals or something. Yeah, yeah I, I'd like to find out more about it. Thank Absolutely. You. I could get, uh, let me ask my electrician to see if we could get a, uh, you know, tutorial or some sort of manual on it. That would be great. Wait, I you're almost started. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. We were on their project and uh, they, they had to uh, change this. Oh, they added air conditioning to the project. They upgraded the service. Yep. So the contractor that I was friendly with came in with a change order of a million dollars to upgrade this. And he had used Anika to get to this number. Yes. And they'd look at every washer, every lock every every, every it is written for the <laughs> it's written for the profitability of the electrical contractor. Yep. Uh, I know you may see it as a convenience and a help to you, but uh, just my experience with it, it's so they ended up going from a million dollars and they spent like a month negotiating and ended up under a hundred grand. Oh, wow. So I, that, that, that stuck in my mind. I forget of a lot of things, but not that much money. Oh yeah. Especially 900,000. Yeah. And the contract, uh, the owner was holding us responsible. Like we were supposed to figure out the, the, mm. they were screwing us for that much money. I mean, we just had no idea, you know? Right. So. Yeah. That's my point. That's exactly my point. Uh, such programs that are written for trades people, are theoretical. They're based upon industry standards, but I'm not so sure that I buy them anyway. So that's why I wanted to. Yeah, I agree. I mean, there, there's a level of production rates there that you gotta, you just gotta be wary of, and then take a look at what's what's fantasy land and what's you know the real world. So, all right, let's go down to progress photos. All right, let me know if you guys need me to zoom in. Um, but this was one of those piece of uh, unforeseen concrete structures that was actually discovered in the center of the building as we started to do the installation of the aggregate piers. Uh, this was way, way below the soil, uh, wasn't attached or any part of the, the foundation slab uh, when Stanford Wrecking removed it. Uh, but we were hit in the impact um, of this concrete and we didn't understand why uh, the aggregate pier installation was stopping at a certain point so we had manafort dig a little bit deeper and we had this nice big chunk of uh, 15 by 15 uh, <laughs> foot piece of concrete come out this next photo here is is the area where the unforeseen existing concrete foundation uh was and is in this picture being removed that's at the northeast corner of the property uh alongside tungsis avenue uh, they were able to do on TNM rip out that concrete, as you'll see here in the next photo. I think they were able to start breaking it up uh, to manageable pieces, so they could start the removal process and the loadout procedure process of, of this found, existing foundation that was found. Next photo here is you can see the layout of the, of the aggregate piers alongside uh, the Mountain Avenue Road. Uh, everything there marked with a pink X and flag is is one of the 460 aggregate piers uh, that were being installed. Crosser, and they're all in now. You said they are all in 100% complete. As you can see here, here's the rig uh, for the installation of the aggregate piers in the middle of of the what's going to be the new Prosser library. You can see all the pink flags of areas that they need to hit with the aggregate pier um, installation. What they do is they first drill the hole with the vibration and, and air uh, to get the hole down to a depth. Then a bobcat will come in, side load uh, aggregate, 
And then that rig that you see here in the vertical position will pull out and it will start vibrating and compacting uh, the rocks into the hole, repeat and rinse basically two or three times until they hit a, uh, a point where they, they'll hit uh, resistance. That resistance is measured up to 30 seconds in a six inch depth. If they don't get down, um, drop it six inches within those 30 seconds, they know they've hit the point of resistance and they can move on to the next uh, aggregate pier. As you can see, this is the Bobcat loaded up with stone. Right now, uh, they're loading up to, to start the next aggregate pier location um, and, and keep that work flowing. This next photo you can see here is some more installation of the aggregate piers along the edge of the Washbrook side of the property. You have one, two, three, four um, aggregate piers that have been installed. Uh, they were able to drill through that that asphalt that we are leaving there just to keep the property clean um, as uh, as much as possible and as long as possible. Um, good, good thing they finished before yesterday. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. So they're, they're out of here. Right here is a picture of the modulus test equipment that's uh, being installed and, and monitored. The modulus testing is done to measure any type of settlement that may occur based on the applied weight. So we have a gentleman that got just got done setting it up down there. And then you'll see on this last photo is, is the final setup and the, and the measurement tools and techniques that they're using for this modulus test. You got through all those 460 piers without injuries? Um, the only one you'll have that small little piece of concrete that 15 by 15. Yep. Or we'll change orders for that one. All right. Anybody have any questions? Uh, well, no change orders because you had the allowance, right? Uh, you're talking about for the foundation? Well, the piers were what triggered the discovery of that other foundation, right? Uh, just st strictly. Um, are, are you asking strictly on the pier install, or <laughs> why did you let go for it? No, yeah, you're correct. So the excavations for the building footprint uh, discovered that existing foundation, right. right? The 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 chunk of concrete that was in the center of the building <laughs> was discovered once we started drilling down for the aggregate pier. Gotcha. So one was yes for the aggregate piers. The other one was just simply excavations for. Um, Getting the building full print laid out. I just worried about hitting bad soil. Or, you know. Nope, that's why we're doing these soil improvements here. So make sure everything gets it gets uh, up to the correct strength for the building. Great, Lois. I have two questions. Um, did you were able to find out where all of this material is going and how it's going to be recycled? Oh, uh, the concrete. No, I have not yet. Actually, the gentleman who um the pm that we've been dealing with for stanford wrecking has been on vacation for a week so as soon as he comes back next week i should have the recycled report and i'll i'll pick his brain and see where what is the actual final use of the material that gets recycled thank you yep um the other question is how much fluid soil is there that may need to be either incorporated into the site or disposed I don't know how many cubic yards yet, but if you drive past to uh, past the site, everything that's stockpiled on poly and that has poly over it mm -hmm. is polluted soil. Oh. Okay. My my recommendation is get it out of there. Because even mm -hmm. if it's cheaper to use it on site, mm -hmm. this is a public building yep. on public land next to a waterway. And we don't want any of these issues in the future. And yep. even even if the rules say it's okay. Right. This is a this is not your average piece of land, right? And it's average price, right? So, well, I we, would encourage you to get it away. Well, what we do have as part of our uh, subcontract agreement with Manaport, we do have a forty-one thousand uh, dollar polluted soils uh, removal, um, as well as uh, some more allowance money established in our GMP. Um, our contract with the town of Bloomfield that has an additional uh, money in there to be utilized for this type of thing. Because we talked about this months ago, I think I raised yep. the same issue. Yep. Yep. Thank you. Well, we, we will also, too, still need to get it characterized and tested to see actually what's in it because there are some facilities that only take certain um, select uh, polluted material. Right. I understand. Right. You know, I think there's one place actually in. Manchester that that might might 
take it. Um, so the closer the location of the facility, the cheaper obviously it gets because you don't need to truck it that far. So Anthony, is it for sure considered polluted soil or do you not know until after the cluster? Um <laughs> we know it's polluted, but to what extent we don't. Okay. Okay. So we'll have a report from GeoQuest. Well, we got. Okay, it looked like a pretty big pile. <laughs> it's a big, it's a big pile. Yeah, yeah, it's a big pile, but well, I wasn't looking like it was all covered. So it's covered. Yeah. It's sitting that on poly, so it yeah. doesn't leach into the ground. We have a poly over it uh, with the weights to not keep it from blowing over, as well as Jersey <laughs> barriers, basically mm -hmm. encapsulating all the soil. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And all those, even though it seems like a big pile, all yeah. those precautions that they took, they prevented it from going into other soils. Okay. And uh, Manaford was very careful about only excavating what they absolutely needed to Correct. for the footprint, because okay. the more they disturb it, uh, the worse the problem is going to get. You mean they'll find more, or they'll they'll disturb the pile that they've already. Yeah, if you're not out. careful, like if they didn't take the precautions they did yeah. with the poly and keeping mm -hmm. it covered and keeping the Jersey barriers, mm -hmm. that like the one bucket of soil spreads all yeah, over the place, guess, and then you've got a bigger mm -hmm. mess. It wasn't that we were not no. digging in order to not no. find. No, no, no. Uh, they were just. My point is, they were very careful with mm -hmm. their approach to it, and they took all the correct steps and notified all the correct parties during the, the, the whole process. Thank you. Okay. More questions for Anthony. Okay, thank you, Anthony. All right, thank you. All right, uh, let's go to our architect. We have Abby is going to present the McMahon schematic options. So go ahead, Abby. Share your screen. Good evening, Abby. All right, hello, everybody. I'm going to share my screen in a second. Um, So since um, the last building committee meeting, um, we have worked on a few furniture layouts um, just to uh, may I give you an understanding of the space that we're dealing with. Um, and um, so there's been a little progress on that end. Um, I have two different scenarios to show you today. The first one I'll be discussing is what the final McMahon furniture layout would look like. And the second one is um, a layout that was done for both uh, Prosser and McMahon that would be temporarily moving in in um, September. Um, let's start with the McMahon layout first. And there are a few options for both these scenarios and I'll go over that. So this is our existing building. And uh, we walk from the parking lot down the west vestibule. This bottom area, Jeff has already discussed um, how we're going to renovate this uh, the toilet rooms to make them ADA accessible. This part has always been the children's area, and we'd like to keep it that way. And there is going to be this new outdoor um, children's area also. Now, while laying this space out, it made a lot of sense to try and use the existing architecture to our advantage and um, sort of use it as a guideline to uh, for our space massing or um, space allocations. So it made a lot of sense to have this, if most of you probably already know that this, there are two high ceiling areas within this entire building. Down here, this dotted line, that's what it means. This is a higher ceiling. This entrance between the vestibule is lower. And then up in the adult area is another high ceiling area. So we thought this would it would make best sense to keep the children's area contained within this space as much as possible. There is a little reading nook that we tried to create, a lot of shelving along the walls, some fun reading tables, um, these could be uh, mobile shelving units. And there is also a space for a youth librarian. This higher ceiling portion can be uh, more of a teens area where they'll, the teen will, teens will have their own reading tables and chairs and some more mobile shelving. 
Uh, and this sort of curved unit, which is, which is actually three separate units, um, that which can also be double-faced shelving and mobile, can be a separation between the teens and the children's section. Uh, we'll have some computers along this wall. And there's going to be this big box here is um, a privacy pod. And what that looks like is um, something like this. Not as fancy as this. The furniture here is much nicer, but we'll see what fits our budget and our needs for this project. But this is a concept of what we'd like to uh, put in here. One of the uh, requirements from the librarians was to have a tutoring space, which we don't um, now that after the re revised scope, we don't have a separate tutoring space or a separate meeting space for that function. So this unit can have glass on in the front and the other three walls can either be solid walls or the back wall is definitely going to be a solid wall, but the sides can have glass, but I would recommend having glass just in the front. And um, this particular type of privacy pod um, goes all the way to the floor, meaning the door opens and it, it directly installs on the floor. It doesn't get anchored to the floor. And when the door opens, it's the exact same carpet. So there is no difference in uh, uh, flooring. Which will, which can make it ADA accessible. I'm just checking on the exact size and what exactly uh, the what the furniture is going to be. So this can also be a wheelchair accessible unit. So that would be the intention out here. Now, most of the layouts that I'm going to show you tonight are based on um, the existing power and data that is available. Now, this is a really old building, and when this was built, there was not much power outlets that is built into the building inside the walls. But I think over the years, the library has tried to bring in power to several different locations, but through wire molds or some sort of raceway that was on the walls. And they are all mostly surface mounted. There is also one pole somewhere in this location uh, where there is power and data coming. Right now, all the IT the IT rack is located up in this, um, what I'm calling an office. It used to be called a multipurpose room, but we've recognized this to be an office space and not necessarily a multipurpose room. All the IT wiring comes from here, goes up to the ceiling, and through the ceiling comes down to wherever it needs to. So we are pretty limited as to where we can put any of the furniture that will require power or data. And in within this teen space, this sound this seemed like the best location where we have some outlets down this side uh, along the south wall. We could run a wire mold and get all these powered. Now this privacy pod will also need power and um, data or if data is a requirement um, because it has its own little um, venting system also. Um, um, so this, this particular space in all the options will remain this way. And I've tried to not mess around with this layout. Um, doesn't matter what the uh, option chosen or the scenario will be. Moving along to the adult area, this particular entrance piece, um, this space, um, it's um it's sort of an awkward size I would say it's not necessarily um somewhere I would it it's not as um this is not a space where we could put any reading tables or anything but one of the options was to consider this to be the circulation desk area now we all have we all know that trenching for power and data is not a choice we have so I will show you in a second what this could be like um but in this layout, uh, there there can be plenty of shelving, and all these are mobile units. And being um, having as much flexible furniture as has always been one of the requirements in this project. These can all be mobile shelving units, which means they are pretty limited in their height. They'll be about forty eight inches height, but they'll they can have up to three shelves. To this right side, where we have the eight foot six ceiling, which is the much lower ceiling. Um, I'm showing 
reading tables and chairs. These chairs can be stacking chairs and these tables can be flip top tables. And in a minute, when I go to the next layout, I will show you a different arrangement of the same furniture in more of an, um, a small assembly type scenario. We can get, have two more of these privacy pods back here because we have lost, we, we really don't have any private meeting spaces and that was one of the important requirements that the librarians have put forth. Um, because there is power here, we thought this might be a, the best um, uh, spot for the business center along with the computer. Now I'm not showing a Jamex machine here, but I know that is something I have to include. I am showing a little tabletop printer or a Scanix. I'll have to check the size again to make sure that fits. However, I know that there has been a concern about having just six computers, which is probably not appropriate. Now, uh, um, given the power and uh, wiring res restrictions, and um, we are looking into options of seeing how else we can bring power. There is a chance that I might move this um, business center out here as soon as I have confirmation that I can bring power and data, but this is the first option. This also will give us plenty of shelving space. On the right side, I have calculated some shelving and the librarians are looking at it. It's, um, um, I have about 739 linear feet. Uh, the 7,500 refers to a volume count, but this is just a rough volume count. Um, uh, it's not just books that are being stored. There are DVDs, CDs, all kinds of media and equipment that can be borrowed from libraries these days. So uh, the, I know the librarians are working to see if this is a good fit for now. This particular central circulation area, because we cannot trench, but there is power and data coming from the ceiling. So what this could be is, something like this. This is a system, it's a post and beam system and this anchors to the floor. But the nice thing about this system is that if we have the drop ceiling as shown in this sketch, we have the ceiling here, we can bring down through this little pole all the wiring we need and all the wires are going to run through this pole, this post and then we can get any any type of power and data we want. This is one way to bring power to this um, to the central uh, circulation desk area. So this was just one of the considerations. However, the sorry, wrong layout here. Um, the concern from the librarians on this layout has been that the circulation desk is too far from the business center, and this is where most patrons would need help. So this needs to somehow be close to the circulation desk. And another point is that it's um, right between both doors and this spot could get a little drafty and cold, but we're looking at the options and evaluating um, all the features to see which ones will work best. So this was option one that was presented and option two, we, um, as I said, the children's and the teens area remains the same but the circulation desk, we moved to this corner. This wall here has an existing, um, sorry, existing fire extinguisher. And there is a Zono machine that the uh, library uses, which is a sanitizing machine. It made sense to maybe have the circulation desk here. It's much smaller unit, but it can have two people. These units can also be mobile even though they're circulation desks, they can come with locking casters and we can provide some sort of storage under these desks. This does, does not change the shelving count much. It's a little bit closer to the business center, but still not the best. This was the second layout I was talking about. If we took all these tables and chairs and put them in sort of a little assembly type space, 
We can still use a couple of the tables um, for demonstration or any purpose and stack away some of these tables. It still gives us a little bit of lounge seating options. Um, so these were the two options for the final McMahon layout that were presented and the librarians are looking at that. Oh, wait a second. I didn't tell you what this is. This unit here can be, um, well, based on all the layouts we the there really wasn't any space allocated or furniture items for book display, which is something all libraries will have. And um, it made sense to maybe make this a book display area if the circulation desk is not here. This, what that looks like is actually two bookcases, this product here. It's a bookcase with a finished back and it can again come with locking casters and we can have a little bench on one side. So there will be two bookcases with a flat top and two benches. Um, this will be a nice little seating area for anyone that's waiting for a ride or just wants to sit there. Um, uh, and also to bring a little pop of color and pattern in, as soon as we enter this space. The, circ the mobile circulation desks, This is these are just some of the pictures. We even have an opportunity to bring some signage into this, this particular furniture item. Again, they can be on locking casters and they can be in, they come in several different heights and configurations. These are just images to show options, but this is not necessarily final. So that's the second layout. Now I know the librarians are have come back with some uh, questions and concerns. We don't necessarily have all the AV that we need in this um, in these layouts yet. One of the options I was discussing with Chris is maybe make these um, uh, these shelving units lower so that we can mount a monitor, flat panel monitor here. Currently, or um, yeah, there was a flat, a smaller flat panel monitor along this wall, um, but that is one possibility if that needs to be a larger monitor, but it doesn't really serve the entire group of patrons that would be coming in if the monitor was here. But Chris also suggested maybe having one on a, a cart, which um, I think the library already owns. So that is another possibility, but um, there are still several things missing, which uh, they're trying, the staff are trying to prioritize their list and make sure that this can still be a functional space. But this is just to give you an idea of what McMahon will look like in the future. Um, the next scenario I'm moving, oh, do you have any questions? Questions for Abby. Lois? Yes. You said something about flip top desks. Yes. Can you show me what that means? Um, I don't have a picture handy with me, but what it is is it this is just a regular reading. It's going to look like a regular reading table. It'll have a T base, and the base will have locking casters. But each of these bases will be connected by a wire and a little um, lever. Once the lever is pulled, the top will flip. And it's going to look like this. It's going to stack away. I see. So it, it, wow. isn't, the, uh, it isn't the individual desks that you have on, uh, beyond that. Uh, no, this is the size of this table when it's flipped. So instead of having tables for four, you have one table per person? It's one table for four people. No, I, as in, I think as I'm... In this layout. Yes. But if one table is, is flipped, it will be it will uh, sit within this space, this uh, footprint. And so what's left there are chairs? These are the chairs, yes. Okay. And they can be stacking okay. chairs, so it okay. should be awesome. easy enough to move. Yeah. I think you can do assembly or you can do. Yep. So it can be a meeting room. Yep. Right. 
Right. There is a question about, um, or I should say a concern about having some visual and acoustic privacy. I'm looking at a few products. Um, the problem is we are limited with uh, storage. So uh, I'm trying to find maybe something on tracks or some type of foldable partition or something. Um, but that that's that, that's still something I'm exploring, but um, at least as of now, there is still a possibility to uh, have this as a much more flexible area. Too bad those folded tables couldn't act as something like that, <laughs> yeah. make them acoustic. <laughs> Maybe there's something out there. Uh, I haven't come across that yet, but... <laughs> Ab Abby, make Jeff find it for you. Yes, <laughs> Jeff, I was just going to say, it's Jeff, you're on to something right. tonight. <laughs> the more next question. Oh, that. sorry. More questions for Abby? Uh, Patrick. Yeah, Abby, Patrick here. Just if you could quickly just explain a little bit about the two rooms on the far end there in the adult section. So the oh, staff, yes. I believe it's the staff lounge and right. the office area. Just briefly uh, touch on those. Yes, sorry, I missed that. Thank you for pointing it out, Patrick. No, that's um, okay. So the staff lounge um, and those office uh, stay um, exactly as what they are. There is a book drop, uh, external book drop. So we will provide a new cart for the books to drop in. This will this is existing casework currently, but we are planning to remove that and give a new casework. Um, the sink uh, now is located at this end, which is not handicap accessible, not wheelchair accessible. So we are going looking into moving the sink to the top edge of this counter. And there will be a small table and some chairs for staff lounge. I am showing some large um, uh, storage cabinets just to make sure there is enough storage within the building, whether it's for just storing personal items, the um, coats and snow boots, whatever for the um, librarians or even other products. Like I know the children's area, they always use lots, lots of um, stuffed animals and lots of different things like that in circulation. So this could provide some extra storage. The office space here, also I'm showing a couple of um, storage units and this can be either a bookcase or another storage unit. <laughs> Uh, Chris had mentioned that the existing IT rack, uh, it, it looks pretty um, not so nice. It um, There's lots of wires. I mean, it, it's very functional. There's all the wiring for the entire building for IT comes from here. But Chris has said that they, they can get a closed cabinet to hide all these wires, <clears throat> which will make space for at least four desks. There is one site manager at this at the McMahon location, and I am hoping to give her a larger desk and maybe even some um, overhead cabinets. The other three are just small desks, more like touchdown stations for the additional librarians. So they will be uh, used more like shared desk spaces. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you. <laughs> Mark, any other questions? Uh, Lois. What is the space next to the two bathrooms, close to the entrance? Is that next to the closet? This one? No, farther up. Yes, that one. Uh, currently, this is an electrical, uh, this is where the electrical panels are, and the switches are all out in this wall. And this is an electrical closet. Um, so we, I don't think we can move this out. Lois, what we're trying to do is keep as much of the existing so that we can put as much money into the finishes and the furniture. Yeah, I agree so, with you. Okay, mm -hmm. so what we did is we made ADA compliant toilets using the existing walls of the janitor closet and the storage room as a boundary and to minimize impact. And I think we got it. And the custodian space, we can get all the clutter on the electrical room and get it in the janitor's closet now because that wasn't working. I mean, it was code wise, there was issues with that. So. We increase the uh, area in the janitor's closet. So, and how much of the electricity is going to be changed out? Will it be a whole new electrical system? Are they? Are you not doing that? Well, Glenn has this uh, through DPW. They have their own uh, list of seventeen items that deal with life safety, and it includes new electrical panels. He's got a list of 
major things that have to be done right away first. So that was part of the whole issue that Glenn had initially. So that would definitely all be upgraded. A new rooftop unit for the mechanical system. But we want to try to keep as much of the infrastructure as we can. That's why Abby's been focusing on where we can take advantage of the electrical runs and data drops. Not to say we can't change it, but right now it'd be good to sort of align what she's doing with what's there so we don't have to run new power in the infrastructure to get there. So that's why we're trying to be conservative in terms of where things are going. I think she's working <laughs> out. I mean, we will have to do some uh, conduit runs and data drops to certain areas, but so far it looks like it's not going to be anything major. So that's good to know. And how about lighting? All new lights, all new LED lighting. And I'm looking at a less than a 3,500 temperature, Kelvin temperature to get it to be a warm light. So it's not a blue light like the hospitals, right? Mm -hmm. So um, I'm pulling together some submittals for Glenn to review to make sure that that's okay. Um, now the we're gonna have new LED lighting everywhere in the two by two grid. The grid right now in there is black. So we're gonna paint the grid. We're gonna replace all the acoustical ceiling tiles as well. So it's a brand new ceiling basically. But we're saving money by keeping the grid. So it's a 15, 16 standard grid. So yeah, see, look at that. It's gonna look night and day. Right? That looks, mm -hmm. that's 1970s. Mm -hmm. It's gonna be 2030. <laughs> and how about um, Wi-Fi? Will that be uh, pro provided so that people have um, computers that don't need to be plugged in can sit down at a desk and work because it seems to me that more and more people um, may be able to c carry their computer in to work if they, Agreed. If they want to. Abby, but, we should probably bring Chris into this discussion, get some wireless access points to tie into that. Maybe Chris can Right. Uh, I'm going to rely on Chris. I know there are uh, Wi-Fi access points already in this building. I, I don't know if it's sufficient for their purpose yet, but uh, I'm guessing there will be. And uh, yeah, Chris might be the better person to answer that question. But I, yeah, but I do that, on that, that our, our FF&E budget, mm -hmm. which is furnishings and technology, mm -hmm. uh, that budget has not changed. Mm -hmm. okay. I just, because there is limited space to put the computers and lots of people aren't using computers that need to be plugged into the wall, Right. Um, the time. Right. Um, right. They do need to have the Wi-Fi. Right. Right. Yes. Right. 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 Perfect. There you go. Um, Bob? Yeah, uh, Abby, yes. bottom right corner below the restrooms, what is that area? Storage. Storage. It's existing okay. right now. It's existing, okay. but it's bigger. It's a little bit bigger now. Good. Okay, more uh, Clark? Uh, she mentioned a couple of times that we can't trench across the center of the building there. We can, but we're trying to save money. So we got minimal trenching in the toilet rooms because the, the wet wall is <laughs> shifting down. So I, I drew for Glenn an area that we're going to need to do some trenching in there. So we're trying to minimize the amount of destruction Good. so that we can keep the money going to the things at the library. So, and I don't know how deep that is. So I'm trying to minimize that. Abby did show that there are some flat electrical wire runs that can be used under the carpet that can pop up with a junction box for different scenarios of things. But she's starting to look at that now, just in case we need it. The engineer is going to evaluate that, that capacity or? Oh yeah, definitely. Because we're going to have, we're going to have some electrical things he's got to look at. <laughs> we're going to give um, probably a light study, the levels. Is there certain uh, uh, light levels that we got to achieve, especially in the 14, six ceilings and then the eight foot six side ceilings. It's going to be a different sort of output for those. And then um, daylight sensors, probably occupancy sensors, daylight sensors. And then uh, what else is going to say? Did you say something else? I forget what I was going to say. Yeah, okay, if you think of it, let us know. Yeah. Uh, any more questions for Abby before she continues? Lois. Mm -hmm. Abby, in terms of the children's area, um, is there space for a play area? Could the um, 
will cases be pushed aside so that there could be a kind of a meeting area the way you've created on the adult side? Yes, yeah, so these bookcases, um, these are, these would be two three foot units put together, but each is a mobile unit. They will be on locking casters, so they can be moved away. What I'm showing here is a rocking chair. And this particular unit here is a cart that can hold up to 10 cushions. So for a reading area, um, and I'm showing some cushions on the floor, not all, but up to 10 kids can be sitting here for a story time. And all this furniture can be, all these cushions can be put back in the cart and this can become an open space. And it's all going to be carpeted. So really the kids can be sitting anywhere for play area, um, depending on where, well, uh, what else we need to accommodate. I, I am showing a few book browsers here. Uh, so we can either the library can either use this space or move this furniture and use something here so all this furniture is easy to move around and they can reconfigure however they want to does that answer your question Liz? Uh, elizabeth yes thank you um abby thank you for this i think you did your best with what is a much smaller project and I think that when we went into this, we thought of McMahon Wittenbury as a full service location. And with the cut of 3000 square feet, it's actually smaller than what we started with. Um, library staff has kind of gotten away from thinking that way because we just don't have the space to do it. Um, so I just had a, I had a couple questions or things I wanted to point out. One is six computers for the adults is definitely too small. Um, staff as a whole felt very strongly that we should think of the digital divide first when it comes to this space. So I think that we do need more adult computers, one. Um, two, to go upon what Lois said, um, you know, a lot of people do have laptops, but laptops require easy access to plug in to be able to use those laptops. So I'm concerned about the lack of receptacles in that building. And I, I know that it is costly to um, address that, but I think we really need to be uh, intentional about making sure that people can plug in wherever they are um, with their devices. So the Wi-Fi is one part of it, but the, the flip side of that is um, being able to get the electrical um, when you're when you need it. Um, three, I'm really, I, I have yet to really think through a solution for the service desk. Um, I hear what you're saying about the center being too drafty because of the doors. Um, do you think we could think about that from a seasonal perspective? Because ideally, we need that big square. We we, we need that larger footprint for um, a service desk. Um, but I also don't want staff to be freezing. So what if, could it be that for uh, as much as we could get away with for the year, we were in that middle space and then maybe when it was just too cold, that's when we had the... Um, the service desk in that smaller footprint away from those doors. Um, so the you other, want both? I, I don't know if that's possible. I'm just trying to think through okay. maybe if it was more flexible that that service desk, maybe we could somehow still keep it in the so, middle, but keep staff comfortable. Okay. What I, I can look at is a desk like this, something more curved, but modular so that if you need to move it, if so, this square, the power, the was um, where is that picture? Something like this, right? So I was going to bring the power through this, or we can just do with regular poles and just try to make the poles look nicer and not so utilitarian, and still figure out the power issue here. Um, or um, as um, Jeff and I were discussing this morning, we can build in some raceways and somehow make sure the raceways make sense with the architecture. And if I'm able to bring these computers down here, I might be able to give more computers and also 
uh, accommodate for the copier, the ScanX machine, Jamex. I'm still working on that layout, but I, I need to talk to a couple of people before I can confirm that, but that is one of the intentions. When, while doing that, if this becomes more of a mobile desk and not such a square, then you can create this big space with the mobile units and you might even be able to move it out. But we'll, before we, um, before I confirm that, um, let's make sure that it makes sense because when we move out the desks, what is the space going to look like? We need to consider that, but um, I will work on that. Um, additionally, I think that the idea of us having even close to this collection size that we originally thought, I think we have to throw that out the window too. Um, in in respect to having more spaces for computers and and people being able to meet and sit and study and hang out and do all all of those types of things. Okay. Um, I know that we talked as a staff more about thinking of it as a skill building space as mm -hmm. opposed to a you know having one of the focuses be that circulating of collection space. Um, and maybe thinking more, I know that we had a huge, a, a pretty big footprint for um, hold materials in the original McMahon and maybe think of it more like that, you know, so people will make their requests and they pick up at this library, but there, it's not so much a browsing library. Okay. Um, so I think if we think that way, we can make the spaces work um, and have it be more in line with what we read on those surveys when we sent the surveys out um, so many years ago now, back in 2020, I, I think we need to rethink about that survey and the responses that we heard from the community about what they wanted at McMahon Wittenbury. Um, that being said, I also know that we have this very aggressive timeline to make decisions. I'm wondering if there's room to bring the community in for a community forum discussion feedback circle so that they could see what we're thinking and give us feedback about that whole process. Um, I, I'm, I'm really concerned about the lack of uh, sharing of information publicly um, about what McMahon, what is happening to this project. Um, and while I think library staff has a really good idea about what the public wants, I, I think having their their vote of approval um, would go a long way. Um, just as the scope is just, it's just changed so drastically. Um, but that being said, the temporary spaces, the ability to move those tables around, um, I know, and also Lois, you asked about those tables. Abby, can I confirm these are the same ones that are at 330 Park currently? The flip tables? Um. Does anybody know if these are the same? I think they're similar. I, I similar, think. okay. So essentially, um, Lois, if you want to get an idea, you can go to 330 Park and see how they are stacked when they're not being used. They still have a footprint, but we would be able to have that space of McMahon, I think, give us that functionality so we would still have, you know, some type of community space for programs and people being able to get together and um, having our, you know, as I said, we have our large scale tutoring happening at McMahon and it before in the before times, um, it would take up the whole library. And now we have a smaller footprint. So again, that's gonna, it's gonna take up the whole library when some of these things go on. And so I think we're gonna have to be really creative in the way that we, we talk about this space. It's gonna be a very different library experience than what people are used to. Elizabeth, I like what you say about um, the libraries having different functions, because I think that will encourage people to go to both libraries, which is uh, really important for this community. And I, I like sending that message that uh, if you want to pick up your books, go to Blue Hills Avenue. If you want to um, you know, search through the shelves, go to Prosser, but everybody go both places. I like that very much. Um, Abby, can can you um, uh, just review a little bit where you think we're at schedule wise, so we can, uh, so Elizabeth can plug in, you know, the way she would like to uh, develop this. 
Okay, so that was going to be one of the things I was going to talk about. So we had, uh, Richard. Had if you're going to get to it, then I'll let you go back to what you're doing, and uh, and we'll get to that later. Um, it's okay. I can address this first since it's it came up first. Um, so uh, Richard, when he made the schedule, we were all we he consulted all of us before he came up with this and. Typically for FFNE, we allocate about 16 to 20 weeks uh, for lead time for the furnitures um, after the purchase orders have been issued. And in this case, we gave 20 weeks um, just, just to be on the safer side and have a little comfort zone in case something happens during the process. Um, now, I, uh, the product that would have the longest lead time is typically the library shelving and um, metal metal has been now um in uh, always has been one of the longer lead time product and um so i talked to our library shelving vendor who uh in the recent last three projects i have worked with them and put purchased through Connecticut state contract. And they have assured me that 18 weeks is a good amount of time. So I sort of found that middle ground. It's not the lowest 16, it's not the highest 20. 18 weeks is good, which gives us two extra weeks to work on this. And um, so instead of the February, we used to have this interiors under interiors we had um, to get the committee approval in end of February, which would be two weeks from now. Instead, we have pushed that to the middle of March, which I think is the March 13th date to get the approval from uh, the committee, which means we will have all the layouts and budgets and a much more precise FA finish schedule to bring to the meeting and get the approval from the building committee. Um, so that should give at least two extra weeks, I'm hoping, for all of us to work on this and make a few decisions. Hey, thanks, Avia. So can, I, can I kind of respond to um, um, the question about getting some public feedback, perhaps an outreach? That will probably add a month to the schedule. And that could happen in March. So you could now advertise for a meeting in March, a presentation, get some feedback, and then compile that and present it back to the building committee. Everything slides by a month. So move-in would be in October rather than September. But that would be my recommendation if we were to insert that kind of public feedback process. Okay, well, I, 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 I think I know you guys are continuing to meet um, and review um, I, I think we really need to lock that down, you know, whether you're going to do that or not. And if we, if we do extend this schedule by a month to, to, or, well, I mean, I don't know that, that, you know, I think we need to hear back from library staff about how, how you'd want to approach that going to the public, whether that month, in fact, is, is that realistic, um, or not, um, uh, so if you could look at that, that would be appreciated. And then. You know, if that's the direction we're going to go in here and take another month, um, then, um, you know, time is, limited. I mean, there's no question about it. You know, we have limited resources here. Uh, so, you know, we have to be respectful of that as well. Um, so I just, you know, want to respect your wishes and, you know, and how you want to go about this. Uh, but hopefully, um, it's a building that we're familiar with. It's a program we're familiar with. Um, it's an audience we're familiar with. So hopefully that all helps answer those questions. Um, yes, it's a different project, uh, but um, I have confidence in everybody to you know to move forward on a on a workmanlike basis. You know. Uh, so, you know, I, I, at this point, I want to leave it in, in your hands, you know, with Abby and Elizabeth, as you continue to, uh, you know, flush this out, because I know Abby used to, like you said, you're still working on a lot of research here and a lot of different ideas. Um, but I'd like to be able to, um, you know, lock that down hard, maybe at our next meeting, you know, see where we're at schedule-wise with that. 
Uh, Mark, so, alternatively, we could um, have copies made of this presentation for handouts to the patrons. Um, they could be at your current swing space in the atrium to um, advise members of the public that this is the thinking and then ask for uh, responses, written responses back to the library staff at atrium. Again, you know, I'll leave that. I'll leave that to Elizabeth. Uh, okay. How they want to handle that, um, but but certainly Elizabeth and staff, uh, you know, your opinions are going to be primary, mm -hmm. obviously. Um, and and I I I hope you wouldn't wait for public input before you do everything <laughs> you can do with it, um, and then somehow interject. Uh, you know, public opinion that you feel is valuable as well. Uh, but I'll leave it up, you know, I suggest we leave it up to you guys right now to continue uh, on the course you're going. It looks like, you know, you're in, you're in, I know you're in good hands with Abby um, to do that. Uh, Bob? Yeah, just one thing I want to point out, that if it does get pushed out a month, that's $16,000 more that's going to have to come out of somewhere, and the only place I know of that can come come from for sure because we can't gamble on contingencies would be ff and e for mcmahon and i don't really i don't think anybody really wants to start reducing that down so that's a consideration too i think you need to take it keep in mind when you're looking at okay going out to the public and seeing what they think and, and how you're going to do it because every every month they get pushed out that's another sixteen thousand dollars potential Bob, I, so let me let me respond. I believe the sixteen thousand you are referring to is the rent per month at yep. Atrium, right? Yep. What what is what is your drop dead move out date from Atrium? Right, right now. Yeah, August. Nancy, do you have that date? It's the end of September. The end of August. The end of August. Yeah, September end of August. 1st. Okay. So in this schedule here, this milestone table that I created with staff. September in September, you're paying September rent. Yep. Yes, we would be. Yes. Yep. All right. Okay. Thank you. I mean, one month. One month. I think we might be able to find, but two or more. That's debatable. Well, it's uh, it's obviously money that we would prefer not to spend because it comes out of something else. Yep. Right? But, but then again, we have a process here to complete. So. Yeah. Um, Let's just be diligent on how we how we do that with our limited resources. Um, okay, so Abby. All right. So uh, the next one I was going to show is um, for this September or end of August move. Um, when Prosser and McMahon have to move into this space. So this circulation area is, um, um, I'll, I have another choice, either this one or the other so mobile desk. The children's and the teens area stay the same. The staff lounge and the staff office will remain. But what the, the library staff needed is somewhere for all the staff to be and be able to function. One choice we came up with was to have some systems panels and uh, small desks so we can get at least 10 people in here. They have about 18 staff members. Um, I think at a given time, there will be at least 15 staff between Prosser and McMahon that will need to be sitting at a desk. Um, one consideration was we would add the circulation desks. Typically, a circulation desk is not necessarily someone's personal desk, because if we are talking billing and accounting and any other kind of work that needs to be done at a much more private and closed space and not out in the open, then this is not necessarily where they would be doing that. But in a, considering this is a temporary move, we counted this youth librarian, the the circulation desk and all the uh, the four desks back in the office along with these desks now there was a big concern from the librarians that this may not really function well because these are minimal size desks they are only four feet wide 
and for the librarians to bring book carts and out, um, it, mm -hmm. this is not going to function very, very well. So this, um, I had a second layout where the, the staff area is pretty much the same. So we came out with the third option. Um, in this case, the adult library shelving has been reduced considerably. However, we were able to give some larger desks out near this window. Uh, this is Blue Hills Avenue. And um, the nice thing about this window is there is existing power at this brick wall here and here. We can pull um, some wires under the window and uh, be able to power all the computers for the staff as and even have a much larger business center area. I'm showing about um, eight, nine computers now. We can have one more if we need to, but I thought one surface should be empty because I have the copier here at the back. And if people need to print and just collate or just assemble the things together, um, it would be nice to have a, a surface for that. Uh, so this entire area becomes sort of the computer IT area. And these panels can be about 72 inches high, which means I can even have some overhead shelving for these, um, for some of the staff members, if not all. Each desk can also have a little mobile pedestal, which is like a little um, uh, 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 a file cabinet, which, have, which will have a file drawer and two smaller drawers on top. Some of, a lot of you must have seen something like that. So they can have their own locking, uh, uh, bless you, locking a storage unit at each desk. That way, this is, it's a, it, if these are 72 inch high panels, this will be a more private space. It's a little further away from the rest of the office, but they'll still be able to function better, we think. And in which case, we can bring the reading space to be out here in this 14 foot ceiling area. And um, the other thing to do would be to not buy the curved, this curved bookcase unit, bookcase and bench unit for now, and just stick with some of the shelving units. Since these are 48 inch high and they'll have a flat top, they can also be used to display new books. Um, but at the same time, they can also have some extra shelving space. Um, I think this is more of the layout that the library is leaning towards for this temporary move. Um, uh, then again, there are lots of other things to consider. Um, as I already mentioned, AV equipment and wall monitors are not something we have really looked into deeply. Um, we don't have an dedicated OPAC station if that is something that the library needs which is like a cataloging center where you would there, there would be dedicated computers where the patron can go and check to see what books are available where which aisles things like that um or even even the interlibrary system within the state can be checked at those stations we don't have one yet we are showing a little self checkout area but uh, if circulating um circulation is not the a uh, key feature in this library, then maybe we don't need that. We can just have this to make, convert this into an OPAC station. Um, the other things are, we don't necessarily have tack boards or writing surfaces. We haven't, I haven't actually asked that question yet. Um, if that is essential, I would imagine tack boards would be necessary to, um, for the patrons to know what's happening in town or if any information needs to be somehow conveyed to the citizens. Um, um, we don't have magazine racks per se, but that could be something to consider. So I think this is probably the best of the three options for this September move. Um, then again, I'm going to wait to see what um, Elizabeth has to say. And her crew, of course. Any questions? Yeah, questions for Abby. Uh, Patrick? Yeah, Abby, mm. in this option for me, uh, the two pods that were in McMahon on the first option, 
you're not showing them here. So are we saying they would just be in storage during this interim period and then brought back at a later date? So good question again, Patrick. Um, right. So we had to sacrifice something to get something. We wanted mm -hmm. to bring in better desk and uh, working conditions for the staff. So we had right. to give up the privacy pods for now. The idea being that we will still keep the one in the teen area so that um, there is at least one one private um, meeting room available for mm -hmm. this building during this move. The other two pods, <coughs> if there is a way to store them at, in, at one of the town facilities, then we can buy and store them and maybe ask the vendors to come back to install them and they will charge a little more for the second delivery and installation, but it can be done. Okay. It's either that or with this temporary move, we have to buy some amount of temporary furniture to support the services that are that are that have to be done uh, at this time. For example, all these desks and chairs and um and the panels will have to be purchased now. But we will um so there's going to probably be a second furniture delivery involved for McMahon. One will happen in end of August, September. The second will happen when Prosser moves out. Mm -hmm. which is when I'm not showing any of the lounge seating that I I had before. Um, right. These lounge chairs, these privacy pods, some extra shelving units, uh, depending on whether we're going to have the shelving or maybe have more reading tables and chairs, whatever it is, there will be a whole bunch of extra furniture that will that should be at the final McMahon layout, which is not going to be here now. So we can either buy them at the, buy all the furniture at the same time, but the town will have to store them somewhere or we'll have to buy them in parts. So we buy some now, whatever we want now for this move, we buy them now. And then the next one we'll buy later. There is no guarantee that the cost is going to be the same because there is a good amount of um, at least eight months between uh, both the moves. So, um, but at least if it's all being purchased out of state contract, then I can at least have assurance that the same vendors will be supplying the furniture. So that uh, okay. that is something we should we need to think about. And um, um, the other part of this is with the Library Grant Commission office, even when we purchase out of state contract they expect us to get at least uh, quotes from at least three different vendors. Um, the reasoning being that they believe that the state contract pricing is a cap and uh, approved vendors can go below that. There is some discussion about, about that between the vendors, but we have had to do this before. So there is a chance that Let's take the privacy pods, for example. I buy one from vendor A because vendor A among A, B, and C, vendor A came in the lowest. And then the next time I buy privacy pods, I want the same exact product, but vendor B had the lowest price. I might end up having to purchase the two others from a different vendor. One way to solve that problem, which I have already been thinking, is maybe the building committee can issue a sole source purchase letter, which usually they will agree um, and accept uh, because we can always say we want to stick with the same vendor and they came in lowest at the first go around. And obviously we don't want another vendor into the game mm -hmm. supplying the same furniture. So this needs, I've, I've given you too much information tonight, but this <laughs> needs a lot of thought. Um, <laughs> Okay, so uh, one last question, and this is more to Elizabeth and the staff. So I guess I'm just curious if you guys uh, have looked at the seating, because I'm wondering, does everyone have to be in the library at the same time? So do you absolutely have to have seats for every single staff person if some part-time people won't physically be there? So I'm wondering if 
you know, even if you cut out three more desks in that one row of three and just add, you would be able to have more shelving space. So I, I'm just pointing that out. I don't know what the priorities are. Is it for space, for staff, or shelving for the collection? But just in thinking through all of this and your scheduling of your part-time staff in particular, would they all need to be in the facility at the same time? So do you actually need that amount of seats? Do, do you need an answer, Patrick, or can we no. leave this to? No, we, I, I just, mean, you know, <laughs> something this is to a, think you know, about. I, I just, yeah, I just hope you guys think Common, about that. Yeah. We don't, we don't need to discuss all that now, but please yeah. take that into consideration. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, you good, Patrick? Yeah. Okay. No, I'm good. Uh, Elizabeth has her hand up. So it is my professional opinion that this approach to library services for eight months is way too long for a community with 22,000 people in it. To give people an idea of numbers, the number of people visiting BPL Atrium increases every month. We had just over 1,200 in December. In January, we had just over 1,400, and we predict that that number will continue to increase. I do not know how we would be able to provide library services for the number of people who need them in this space for eight months, and eight months being if everything goes well. Um, as we know, this project has changed course so many times. Um, so that's, that's the one thing. Um, two, having library work happen like this, library work is big. So when a library staffer is doing work, you, you need space either to, to have books, to have all the stuff that we do. Um, you, you need space. And so I do not know how we would be able to have staff sitting on top of each other like this. Three, to address Patrick's question, um, I think we really need to get the acting town manager involved in these conversations um, because there's a lot to think about in terms of staffing um, with current policies right now. Um, working from home is an issue. There's not a current work from home policy on the books. Um, so the answer is, Patrick, if we had more flexibility, we wouldn't need this much space for staff, but it's kind of very rigid, the, the town's approach to these types of things. Um, but if we did move back into McMahon, we would be able to expand our hours. So that would take off heat um, in terms of part-time staff and how that would work out and play out. We would be able to have a seven day per week operation. Um, but again, I do not think putting our staff and our operations here is respectful to our staff or our public. Um, and again, we wouldn't be, we would essentially be putting our collections away for eight months because collections would not fit in this space. Um, let alone building and preparing for opening a brand new state of the art library, 30,000 square foot library at Prosser. We would be kind of, it, it would be very difficult. And also the major disruption in service. We had a major disruption in service when we closed our doors at the end of June. And we had to teach our public again how to how to do everything. This would be not. This is a ten thousand square feet of library space here. Ten thousand square feet. That does not include staff space. Staff space would make that even more. So the the library at BPL Atrium is ten thousand square feet. This is six thousand square feet, and it would be need to be for library services and staff just to get everybody uh, an idea of the size of what we're talking about here. And I think these data points are, are really important um, to get to, to the bottom of this. Um, and I, I, I just, I'm, I, I don't see how this could work. I, I just don't see how it could work for staff or our public and not having access to library collections for eight months in a town that already um, is challenged with our, um, with, with a lot of issues. Um, I, I, it would be a very inequitable approach to, to making this project work. So I hear you, Mr. Berman, about $16,000 per month. I, I, I know that the rate here was negotiated. I don't know if we could negotiate again to get that closer to the 10,000 per month, but I think we need to think about some other solutions um, that does not include 
the entire staff and library operations operating out of McMahon Wittenberry. Well, the good news we heard tonight, it's probably more like six months than eight months. I, oh, I that is that is good news. It's, it's in the right direction. It's in the right direction. Um, you know, the moment we uh, uh, opened our bids, we knew we were going to have problems. And here we go. Uh, so, you know, I, 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 I really look to you, Elizabeth, and staff to, to try and make this work. We can, uh, you know, there's nothing stopping us from exploring other avenues. But... But we do have an urgency of time here, uh, and, um, and hopefully we can all work together and you know make it through this period. That's the goal. Um, so I know Abby is still working on arrangements and so forth, and for you guys to digest all of this, um, you know, I, I, I again, you know, I, I have faith <laughs> you're going to make all this work out, um, and no, it's not easy, uh, but. We need to do it. Um, Mr. Berman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Abby, the temporary desks that you identified up there is option three. What are you going to do with them after? What's going to happen when, uh, when Prosper opens? Are they going to be reused? Um, so that's a good question. I was looking at the Prosser layout also. Prosser is um, very nicely designed at this point. Um, and I know Jeanette has had several conversations with the library staff and um, uh, and so many other people who have given a lot of input. And I was hoping this can be re reused at Prosser, but at this moment, I have not been successful in trying to reuse this furniture. So the town will own it. If the town wants to use this somewhere else, we can look at that. Or if I have a little more time to explore, we can see um, if uh, I can somehow use this at Prosser. I, I don't know. That was a very good question. And I did give it some thought and I haven't come up with a proper solution yet. All right, thank you. Sure. I just oh. wanted to add one more thing. Um, sure. sure. And that was United Way just came out with a study of Northeastern Connecticut, our area specifically, where they found that 61% of low income youth had zero books at home, zero, meaning the books that they did have access to were from school and the library. So I just want to reiterate again, six months, eight months, potentially longer than eight months, this would be really devastating to our families and our youth if we had to put so many of our collections away um, for that long. All right, more questions for Abby? Lois? I, I just wonder what the increment in the budget is for adding the temporary furniture. Um, I haven't gone through a full exercise of understanding the cost yet, in fact, but I have started working with the vendors, especially on the library shelving and certain other items. Uh, at this point, I'm just looking for some proper input so that I can start working on the budget, which would be the next coming steps. Thank you. Okay. Abby, are you, are you all the way through this, you think? Yes, I am, unless anyone has questions. Anything else for Abby? All right, Abby, thank, thank you, you very much and a lot of work. Great work. Uh, don't thank have to you. appreciate it. Uh, anything, uh, let's see, anything else from TSKP? I'd like to just show <laughs> Jeff is here. A brick sample of what is going to happen at Praza. It's a flashed brick. And Abby, if you can pull up that slide on the PowerPoint, what we were looking at, well, Tyson gave a presentation about a year and a half ago where he uh, showed everybody the sort of references in the vernacular of what we we're trying to go for with this. Um, yeah. So um, the process here is... Uh, there will be a mock-up on site using this brick. Right. Uh, the mock-up is there to show all, all the construction and details and so forth of the exterior wall and so forth. But, but the brick will be there and you will be 
looking at choices of water color as well as yeah, true depth. Pick two two uh, colors that will be in the mock-up that we'll have to choose from on the site. But I wanted to wait and see where the natural light hits it, and what the color is going to be. The whole idea is that for it to be a sort of mock brick, not unlike buildings of some of the churches and buildings you even have in town. This one happens to be in Hartford at Center Church. So you see the white porch, the white trim. We'll have some light color precast concrete sills and then a very standard traditional color of brick. Very classic, very simple. My um, my feeling here was to leave this to Tai Su. Uh, you know, in the selection of the brick, it's, you know, it's his design, it's his building, uh, you know, to tie it all together. Um, I don't know if anybody had strong feelings otherwise, um, but I, you know, I'd rather keep the vision, uh, you know, where it belongs, you know, with, with Tai Su uh, and this, this selection. Let's Mark, if I could, those. if I could add to that, if you would allow me. Sure. So, the the slide that you see on the screen now is one of the slides that was used to make a presentation to planning and zoning to the design review commission, and it was it was a public presentation in which we uh, tried to create the impression that we wanted to achieve, architectural impression that we wanted to achieve with the Prosser Library. So this is a matter of public rec record. I think it was reviewed and accepted by the various bodies that we presented to. We, we, we really don't want to go to a different kind of material on the exterior that would be straying away from what we publicly presented in the past. So we're asking the committee if we can uh, approve this brick, because that's our recommendation. It's consistent with what our vision was that we've already presented to the public uh, the fine details regarding mortar color that will that will be mocked up in reality, so we can see how the mortar uh, and the brick combined, what kind of effect that will have. So uh, we would like to proceed. Uh, we, we feel that this is consistent with the original intent and as it was presented to the public. That's what I wanted to add. Okay, tonight. Um, yes, he's looking forward okay. tonight. Okay. Um, Clark, so, so this brick will give us that appearance. Is that what you're yeah. saying? Because this seems to have a lot of flash into it. Okay. Yeah. Well, there's a range to it. Yeah. And the, and the mortar color will pull it all together. So it's going to be, you know, very monolithic, natural brick color, basically. I don't know what else to say. This is what Taisu picked. And it's relating to a lot of vernacular in town and the church. So. I mean, I, I, honestly, I've been, you know, I've been on a number of projects over the years uh, uh, where it's a, a standalone building out of context with anything else. And many times building committees are asked to uh, make a choice among three or four different bricks. And honestly, I, I really didn't feel that, that was the right direction for us to go in, especially because Taisu has been, you know, looking at it in context, in town. Um, and that's why I, you know, I'm comfortable uh, going with what well, we just selected. Add to that is that <clears throat> all these presentations happened a year and a half ago, so I, I assume there was consensus on all of this. And as far as the particulars of a slight flash or not flash for me, I thought that, you know, we already had sign off on, on the brick, and I'm hoping that we all have to go through sign off on every material thing. That we're going through the construction because it's going to add to the schedule. Well, that's my concern. Well, no, there has been no specific sign off on the brick. I mean, we, you know, we've signed off on the concept. Uh, we signed off on yes, it will be brick, uh, and it's going to be red brick, basically. You know, uh, but, but there was no actual, you know, uh, specific that is the brick. Um, uh, but I wanted to get us past that point tonight, hopefully. You know, if we have mm -hmm. consensus or if somebody would like to make a motion, yeah. we want to do that. Uh, is the motion about the brick? Yes. Or is it about letting Tai Su um, do all of the choices? Well, you could you could phrase That's it that way if you mind. so choose. Yeah, uh, I don't, though. <laughs> 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 After my experience with the rug, <laughs> with the carpeting, so I would move to approve this brick 
and whatever interstices that need to be done to go with it. All right, we have a motion from Lois, seconded by Second. Patrick. Um, any discussion? Don't see any hands. Okay, all in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any nays? We pass the motion. All right, thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. Jeff, what else have you? Well, I'm just thinking now, it's like I'm getting bombarded with submittals and we're moving to do this thing. I'm just wondering, can I get a list of other things that you'd like to see then to go through this? Because <laughs> at this stage of the game, I don't know if we can afford to do that. I mean, what are you thinking? Like the color of the white on the porch? And what else are we thinking? Carpet? We want to we see the carpet. Carpet's done. Carpet. Okay. Carpet's done. Carpet is okay, so we're thinking of the wood ceilings and the natural wood ceiling. And the I, I we think already... we've already okay. agreed to that. Okay. Yeah. But there was a problem about the what the display would be in the children's area. Okay, so and you want to did... see that? No, we've seen it and we've okay. decided. Okay. But things like that that make a difference interior, I would like to see, yes. Okay. Any, are there, there are still color choices to be selected. Yes. Uh, Jeanette and, uh, and Abby, there are... Still colors to be selected, right? Not, so, not not for Prosser so much, but um, we do need to do it for McMahon. Right, right. No, but I, well, I was going. To, I was actually thinking about Prosser. Are there any color selections yet, uh, still to be made? No, I think we've gone through everything. Okay, get some drawdowns in there. There's some drawdowns coming. Yeah. Okay, all right. Um, I mean, if we if we see something at the owner meeting. Um, you know, we have that opportunity to to say, "Whoa, well, wait, let's bring it to the committee." So, and I thought the librarians might like to be involved in this environment in which they're going to be working. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, what else do we have from our architect? That's it for me. Okay. Richard, you all set? Yes, all set. Thank you very much. Uh, Bob Berman has a question. Yeah, thank you, Richard. Uh, yeah. You know, I want to thank Jeff for, for the schematic stuff on where the uh, card readers are and everything. That's very helpful. But I presume there still are some lock, key lock doors. I believe so. Yeah, let's go through the list. Let's yeah, see. it seems to me there probably still are. Is there a reason why there are key locks rather than cards? I'm not sure. I'll have to go back through the meeting minutes that happened a year and a half ago with the town and everybody decided that because the package went out. I'll have to pull the spec and pull the meeting minutes and go through the okay. history of that. Because there's ver uh, the difference in cost, if there is any, is minimal between key locks and card, the card reader, especially since we own the equipment and the software. And you have much better control with cards than you do with keys. So you know, and I'm very happy to see what what's happened. That a lot of the ones that initially look like they're going to be keys are not going to be card, which makes more sense. But you know, for instance, the, the offices maybe cards make more sense than keys. That kind of thing. I mean, I can see where, for instance, uh, storage rooms and so forth. I can see that where where <laughs> key locks might make more sense. I mean, that. That's just what my thinking is and the rationale for it. Okay. That's what brings it up. Well, okay. where, where do we go from here, Bob? Do you have a complete list of all the locks and which ones are card readers and which ones are keys? Uh, yeah, he sent me the schematic. Identify which are, are uh, card readers. And I'm presuming the rest of them are not. I mean, I can send you a list of what, what I can identify. Well, so, Jeff, did we present or did we give Bob the final? I think that's what he gave me. Yeah, Bob asked the question of which ones were card readers. So I sent him a PDF of the technology sheet that showed all the card reader locations. And I even highlighted them in yellow. Yeah. So okay. he's going to be happy with that. Now the question is, where are the locks on the other doors? So we'll have to go through. I know that whole package, the hardware package is in my box to review. Yeah. So now we got to go back and look at the meeting minutes because I know that everybody had input 
with the town DPW everybody on what locks were what. So we'll, we'll pull that out and see. What so I want, want to remind everyone that we have bids now. We have firm prices. Right. Well, okay. So that list of locks and card readers, Jeff, that's the subcontractor submittal? Yes. Okay. That's what we bought. Right. So right. if we if we make I'll, any changes, I'll, I'll drop be... it, I'll drop it then, Richard. Okay. All right. I don't want to but just just to close the loop in communication, I would like to ask Jeff to give you um, a clear indication of which ones are cards and which ones are maybe it's obvious in the submission. I, I pretty much, a lot of it is. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Okay, and thank you everybody at TSKP. All right, let's um, let's go on to Sean, our owner rep. Thanks for your patience. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll share my screen. I didn't have an opportunity to print out my um, my report tonight. Um, Sean, you're more than welcome to use our printer in the field office. In the field office. Okay, I'll take you up on that next time. <laughs> I'll try and be brief. Um, I did put a little introduction uh, based on comments from the general public last meeting. Um, Collier's Project Leaders is contracted by the Town of Bloomfield to provide owners representation during the construction process. It assists in the coordination of items that do not fall under the purview of the construction team or the design team. Um, and some examples are high level construction observation and reporting back, working with the materials testing agency, uh, the commissioning agent for the project, and move management. Um, in terms of reporting this meeting, um, Tri-State, the um, materials testing agent, has been on site and observed all the um, installation of the Vibro piers uh, that Anthony had reported on earlier. So that is uh, independent observation of that installation, which is on the town's in the town's best interest. In terms of commissioning, again, this is um, at the end of the project, making sure all the systems in the building work. Uh, Van Zelm is uh, contracted directly by the town again to go over everything. Uh, we had a meeting with them today just to introduce them to the project. And so along the way, they can be checking the installation of all the systems as a third party representation. Um, in terms of overall progress on the site, we kind of already talked about the uh, potentially contaminated soils. And it's my opinion that, you know, everything was done the correct way by Downs. Um, you know, they, they notified GeoQuest when they were disturbing the soils. They took the proper precautions with all the soils. And I think these steps will minimize, as um, Anthony was saying, minimize the cost and schedule impacts. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, I did attend a pre-installation meeting for the con uh, concrete, which will be the next step in the process. And uh, if anyone has any questions, I know I went kind of fast, but, <laughs> but if anyone has any questions, I can certainly answer them. Questions for Sean? Okay. Yeah, so we thank you. You're quite welcome. You. you know, we've heard that name GeoQuest come up a few times. I just want to let everybody know we're happy to have them on board. They're here in town. They're, they're a Bloomfield company. Mm -hmm. so. He's been nothing but responsive every time you needed him out there. He was so it's, he's fantastic. So I'm glad to hear that's working out. Yeah. Okay. Sean, we thank you. Uh, Nancy, what do we have for purchases, invoices? No purchases, but speaking of GeoQuest, we have an invoice from them. <laughs> I, I didn't forget. It is invoice number 10100 for services <laughs> through January 17th um, for environmental consulting on the project. This is in the amount of $370.60. I move, I move acceptance. Move by Bob Berman, seconded by by Lois. Thank you very much. Much comments. comments. I'm sorry, Marsha. Marsha. No. Okay. Okay. Your light went on. Your light, light went on. Okay. All in favor, please uh, say aye. 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 Any nays? Motion passes. Thank you. And the only other invoice we have is for TSKP Studio.
for Prosser Basic <laughs> Services through the month of January. It is invoice number 200-802-25 for $195.563.10. Do you have a motion for approval? So, second. Patrick, second by, by Roland. Thank you very much. Questions, comments? Um, this is essentially some catching up on uh, the agreed on um, uh, additional fees that we had uh, voted on last week. Correct, Nancy? Um, it does not include all of them, no. No, uh, well, it's uh, it's some of it. Yes. I mean, it's, you know, whatever has yep. been accomplished, but okay. All right. Uh, questions? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any nays? Nays. We have a nay. One nay. Motion passes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. with an echo. I think it's right. an echo. There was an echo? Yeah. Yes. I, I, think, echo. Okay. I think everybody passed it. Okay. Yeah. Appreciate that. <laughs> All right. So that leads us to our uh, upcoming. <clears throat> oh, no, we have uh, comments. Comments from committee. Let's move to, uh, we have meetings tomorrow in February the 28th, and I will not be present for that, Patrick. Yes. Um, and then we're into March, March 13th, and public comments. Nancy, do we have any hands up from the public? Yes. Wendy Williams. Go ahead, Wendy. Good evening. Um, my name is Wendy Williams, 48 Gab Road in Bloomfield, and I'm going to speak briefly tonight on behalf of the Bloomfield Lions Club. I'm the president of the Bloomfield Lions Club. So what I would like to put out there to the board, the library committee um, as a whole is the Lion, Lions Club would like to collaborate on a portion of homebound uh, delivery of books, if that is possible, and if we could work an agreement to um, help get some of get books to some of our clientele or individuals that really are looking for them. Um, this did come to fruition. Um, as the president of the Lions Club, we're always looking for new membership opportunities. And there are a variety of Lions Clubs in the perimeter that use the library as a source to gain membership, to um, you know speak with the members of the community and use that as um, an alliance. So we thought that the Homebound program, seeing as we are in the swing space and after listening to this presentation, being a little bit smaller of a swing space that we could help provide some service to the public um, in assistance to the library. What our recommendation or what our um, what we'd like to bring to the table as a club would be that I would say 3-1 as soon as possible, but as of 3-1 through the end of June, we would commit to um, once a week bringing books to homebound individuals. What we would like to start with um, as a club would be some of our elder community groups, such as Duncaster, Seabury, maybe Federation Homes, Dorothy Drive, possibly Bester Lane. But some of those larger communities, we have a small group, most are retired, and we would like to dedicate one day a week to get books to those individual communities and see how that goes. We would consider broadening out, or if it becomes too much for our small group, shrinking back a bit but at least to help engage with the library as a civic organization and with the public to help um, in a place where there's a need. I do know that there's an issue with insurance. The Lions Club does have an insurance policy, so we would be covered. I could provide um, you know, a policy that would cover us on those days for the delivery of books. What my thought was, and I did approach Elizabeth about this about, it must've been about a month and a half ago, time goes by very quickly where we would have coverage from us stepping into the library and picking up books to bringing them to the facility and then returning the books back to the library. So the insurance is not an issue. Currently we do Meals on Wheels in town and this would be a very similar process um, for us as a club. We would just pick a day during the week where our members would sign up. Um, we do have four to five members who would commit to doing this. So if we had one or two members one day a week, we could you know, facilitate amongst those various locations. And it would not have to be at a specific time of the day. Um, I personally work and I, I would love to be a part of this. So I would be more willing to do it in the early evening, but we do have a lot of members 
who wouldn't mind doing it, you know, in the early morning hours or lunchtime hours to drop off and pick up books. So I did want to throw that out to this committee. Um, I am more than happy to answer questions on behalf of the club, but wanted to throw that out as a um, community service club in town to work in um, coordination with the library. Thank you. And Wendy, th thank you very much. That's great. I, I, I would like to say that, you know, the library building committee is, uh, uh, you know, is responsible for the project and not responsible for library operations, uh, you know, as long as it doesn't affect, you know, the project itself, uh, I would say, you know, uh, I recommend that you, you know, go directly to uh, Elizabeth, uh, the, uh, the Library Board of Trustees. <laughs> it's really an operational uh, issue here. So the Library Building Committee really doesn't have anything to say yes or no about uh, with this other than that's great. Thank you. We have Linda Pagani. And we have uh, Linda. Thank you. Yes, um, you know, of course, you won't be surprised when I say that this is very disconcerting, um, especially when I see the combined operations of Prosser and McMahon in a reduced McMahon. And so if there really can be no collection there, it really it brings up a fundamental question of what is that space? Because right now at the atrium, there's the full McMahon collection, as far as I know. Um, the Prosser collection, the patrons, the, the taxpayers who we have paid for all these materials, we have not been able to access, access those materials since June. Now, uh, I understand we won't be able to access those materials until Prosser is open, but now to say that we cannot go to a library in the town of Bloomfield and look at materials that we, for six or eight months, will have to travel to other towns which means we have to have transportation. We have to have the money to be able to do that, the time to do that. Um, it, it's, it's, it's just not a viable alternative. Again, we, the taxpayers of Bloomfield have paid for all these materials and we should not be having to spend six to eight months without getting to look at least at the McMahon materials. The only thing that could be accomplished if this does go through is that you would have to know, you as a patron would have to know the materials you want. You can't go in and have your intellect peaked, which is the whole purpose of a library, by seeing displays because there won't be any. And so it really is, what is the purpose? We're seeing tables with four people at it, like 16 people, 10 kids can sit on cushions. You know, there's this supposed play area. Well, that's great, except with climate change, it's either too boiling in the summer for those kids to go out there. Um, you know, that's that's just a side issue. But the main thing, what we're all in this for is for patrons, Bloomfield taxpayers to have access to the materials. And so I would say, since the atrium is so beautiful, yes, it has limitations of ours. That's the only limitation that it has. It has everything else. Yes, it does require people to get transportation there, I, you know, I totally concede that point, but I think if there, we should try to find a way, we as a community, the town council, the town manager, potentially this committee, which is doing a fantastic job, don't get me wrong, it's nothing about that, but if it's six months at 16000 it's $96,000, 
the, in, in, in light of this whole budget, I'm sorry to say that is not that much. Um, you, Google, could you wrap it up here? We exceeded the time. I'm okay. I'm speechless after I've sat here for two hours waiting to talk, I'm, but I'm, whatever, whatever. Okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Linda. Gail Riley. Go ahead, Gail. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to raise my hand. Oh. Sorry. Next time, Gail. <laughs> okay. Anyone Any else? Hands? Anyone else from the public wish to speak? Going once. Okay. I thank you all for attending. I thank you no, for wait, your comments. Wait, wait, wait. No, we have a uh, Marilyn Johnson. Oh, okay. Sorry. Just a minute, Marilyn. Go ahead. Marilyn Johnston, go ahead. She's muted. She's muted. muted. Can you hear me now? Here you go. Yes. Okay, I simply want to commend the last speaker. Uh, as a citizen of the town, I think she she made a very valid point. My concern is a lot of us haven't been keeping up minute by minute to these changes uh, and the size of Wintonberry being smaller. I'm concerned about the impression that people have been waiting to see a new McMahon Wintonberry branch and they will come in uh, or they will hear about this without explanations. And I think communication is probably very key uh, or they're gonna be just completely baffled. Uh, and I think an intervention and ex explanation maybe through emails to the base of patrons about what, what the transition of the transition is going to be like, I think it's necessary. Otherwise, um, people may feel no faith going forward um, that that Wintonberry will emerge as a branch library they can be proud of. And I'll just say, secondly, I think the staff would be completely stressed out in a situation like this uh, where <laughs> they'll be on top of each other, truly. I've worked at the branch for 20 years and um, and in Prosser, and I know what it was like to live in a, a small space. And I, I'm just concerned about the image and the morale of the public as they confront this without any explanations. So I just do wanna advocate for good communications on this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. Mm -hmm. Anyone else, Nancy? Yes, Jordan W. State your Hello. name. Hello, Jordan Walters. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, perfect. Um, so just to piggyback on the last person that spoke, um, as a long-term Bloomfield resident, there are some changes that I've heard tonight that are concerning to me. Uh, so how can community members like myself stay informed and provide input, essentially, on these changes as they're being made? Uh, this is the first time I'm hearing of um, essentially the, the original plans um, being downsized by, you know, possibly 3,000 feet or more uh, than what we were originally ex expecting. And I understand there are changes that are made um, and, and things that have a compromise that have to be made as well. But I definitely want to stay on top of these changes um, and provide relevant input as these changes are being made as um, a long-term resident. Thank you. Anybody else that would like any, to speak? Any other comments? That's it. Yep, Jordan, uh, Jordan, we meet every two weeks. Uh, <laughs> and we also report to town council subcommittee, uh, governance committee, and we also report to council. So uh, 
basically those are all the opportunities as well as reaching out to the library itself uh, to find out what's going on. So, um, you know, those are the opportunities uh, to, to find out what's happening. No other hands, Nancy? No. Okay. Well, I thank you all again. Um, we do have an executive uh, session item on the um, agenda, which will not be necessary. Uh, I had put it on there uh, last week. Uh, we eventually will be um, uh, reviewing the fees from TSKP for the McMahon uh, project, uh, what's remaining on their fees, what the new fees will be as we go forward. Uh, but we're not prepared to uh, talk about that at this point. So I would say next meeting we'll be doing that confidently. Uh, so if there are no objections, we will go right to a motion to adjourn. So moved move by Mr. Berman, seconded by Clark. Clark, thank you. Thank you. All in favor, David, please. Aye. 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 All right. I thank you all and happy Valentine's Day. <laughs>